Max Schachtman, formerly a Trotskyite leader, now a leading theoretician of the American Socialist Party. Until the crash occurred, it was thought there was something unique about American capitalism. Even the radicals felt it. They were in bad shape. The communists were racked by internal strife. The socialists were stagnating. Ford was paying his workers $5 a day, unprecedentedly high wages. It seemed the class struggle was coming to an end, and radicalism might disappear. But the 1929 crisis created a revolution in thought. It affected liberals, and in many cases conservatives, as well as radicals. What was called the collapse of American capitalism had an enormously stimulating effect on the American Communist Party. It underwent two phases in the 30s, the first five years of the decade and the second. This phenomenon had something of a third phase too. At the beginning, it purged itself. It has nothing to do with events in the United States. As always in the case of the communists, it reflected happenings in Russia. On the eve of the, quote, collapse of American communists, the CP expelled a group of us for espousing the counter-revolutionary policies of Trotsky. Other expulsions followed. The conflict resulted in at least a dozen different factions. This bewilderment kept the party in a state of paralysis. However, the oncoming mass unemployment on a scale hitherto unknown in this country enabled the communists to organize the unemployed and stage vigorous protests. They were initially the leaders of this movement. In New York and Union Square, they were able to gather as many as 100,000 people at a rally. Hoover was still president. Since he didn't offer even the mildest form of amelioration for the unemployed, the Communist Party seemed to be riding high. But its success was illusory. At bottom, the unemployed worker was uninterested in communism. He was interested in one thing only, a job. The CP could involve him in demonstrations, but it couldn't get him a job. It was the New Deal that subsequently did this, at least for a few million. With the election of Roosevelt, the party entered a new phase. It envisioned the complete decay of capitalism and the impending triumph of international proletarian revolution. It engaged in the most militant policies imaginable. Everybody to the right and some to the left of the party was considered the enemy. Socialists became social fascists. They were more vigorously attacked than the real fascists. During the first New Deal period, Congress was referred to as the Fascist Grand Council. Although it was of transitory nature, Communists were making progress among the unemployed. Unfortunately, they deepened the gulf between themselves and every other radical group in the country. Red trade unions were created. Their programs were revolutionary as all get out. Their leadership was hot as a pistol. They had only one defect, few members. Consequently, their reputation among trade unions became really bad. There are few crimes as great in labor circles as dual unionism, dividing the ranks of workers in their confrontations with employers. Nevertheless, capitalism looked pretty sick. Wide segments of the population were radicalized. In liberal and academic communities, Marxism, which had been considered passé, became popular again. There was more writing about commun communism and Marxism. Favorable, though not very perceptive in many cases, during these years than in any other time in American history. In the late 20s and early 30s, thousands of young people had joined the Socialist Party. 
they kept pushing the socialists further and further to the left, in many instances borrowing the jargon of the communists. This led to a split. The right wing, many older socialists, pulled out, especially after the Detroit Convention of 1934, when a platform was adopted in favor of the dictatorship of the proletariat. These parallel developments among the communists and the socialists were influenced, aside from our domestic crisis, by two events in Europe. The first, the triumph of fascism in Germany. Hitler had overthrown the Weimar Republic without any real resistance by the world's two largest radical parties outside Russia, the German Communist Party and the Social Democrats. They capitulated without firing a shot. There was conjured up a return to barbarism in modern form in the danger of a Second World War. This was about 1933. The second event was the Russian Five-Year Plan, inaugurated by Stalin. The world outside knew little of its details. Later, it learned of the horrors associated with it. But what stood out in the minds of 99 out of every 100 of American radicals was this contrast. There was no smoke in American factory chimneys. There, production was going on like mad. Everybody was working. And of all the great powers, it was Russia that was intransigently anti-fascist. Yet in spite of all this, radicalism did not take deep root in the United States. The Communist Party had added a few thousand members, but it was still insignificant in the political life of this country, especially when contrasted to the American Socialist Party at its peak in 1918. It had over a hundred thousand members. It was in the second half of the 30s that a big change occurred in the American left. There was the New Deal, and especially the birth of the CIO. Labor entered politics as the unorganized were organized. Radicals of all persuasion were deeply affected. The communists and the socialists, because of their experience, were virtually sucked into the movement. In many cases, they were the moving forces. With the rise of Hitler and the Spanish resistance to fascism in the Civil War, a most decisive event followed. A radical turnabout in communist policy. The People's Front, the United Front, came into being. The party abandoned the theory of social fascism. The United Front welcomed all radicals, all liberals, and for that matter, all right-thinking capitalists. Everybody. The New Deal and Roosevelt were embraced. Speeches called for understanding of the National Association of Manufacturers. Had any radical suggested these ideas in preceding decades, he'd have been politically lynched. There were only two prerequisites, friendliness to Russia and hostility to Hitler. As far as the Communist Party was concerned, it was quite effective. Certainly unity among radicals is better than internal strife. It was a party of friendliness. How could anybody oppose it? You'd have to be against motherhood. Soon the policy of working in the Democratic Party became accepted. This was natural. The labor movement was overwhelmingly behind Roosevelt and the New Deal. It wasn't a matter of taking it over. I don't believe all this right-wing nonsense about their capturing the Democratic Party. It was merely a matter of influence. In comparison with its utter isolation in the first half of the 30s, this was an enormous advance for the communists. But it was all an illusion. Its Achilles heel was its subordination to Moscow policy. The party had been doing fine. It was against fascism, for the loyalist movement in Spain, for the CIO, for all the nice things in the New Deal. What the hell more do you want from a radical party? There's never been anything as nice as this in American history. Then 
virtually overnight, it destroyed itself. It backed the Hitler-Stalin pact. The shock was volcanic. The labor movement drove them out of its ranks. It lost liberal support. It was reduced to insignificance. At the end of the decade, the CP appeared far more discredited, far more isolated than at the beginning of the 30s. And from that, it has never recovered. There was a burst of respectability with the invasion of Russia by Hitler. Once again, radical and liberal intellectuals flocked to its bander. But it, it was a brief moment. Then came the Cold War. Today, even the new left looks upon it as obsolete, puritanical, conservative establishment. It's funny if it weren't so tragic. It's sad because of its effect on a genuine American radical movement. It looked for a moment at the beginning that it might become that. It never did. The decline of the Socialist Party is even more regrettable, especially to me. For the past 10 years I've been a member, this party did not understand, and now is only beginning to understand, the profound political revolution wrought by Roosevelt and the New Deal. A new political coalition was created, labor with its many ethnic minorities and Negroes. At first, it was sentiment on the part of the Blacks. Now it is organized. I'm convinced this coalition is going to remain a decisive element in American politics for a long time to come. This coalition worked. It did not produce socialism, but then that wasn't Roosevelt's intention. He saved our society in a new bourgeois reform way. I hate to use this jargon, but there you have it. Capitalism remains. So the socialist vote continues to decline. The enormous sympathies it once enjoyed in the labor movement has thinned down to nothing. The communists, because of Moscow, are ruined. The American left is nothing as compared to its role in European countries. Nothing breaks my heart more than to say this. Our stupidity in not recognizing the significance of the coalition, our failure to identify with this group, our isolation from the mainstream of American political thought, our special language which no one understands. It's a pity. I don't expect our power structure to build a radical movement. I expected the radicals to do that. Up to now, they have failed. As I watch the new left, I simply weep. If someone set out to take the errors and stupidities of the old left and multiply them to the nth degree, you would have the new left of today. The radicals of the 30s have gone their separate ways. Only a handful retain their old commitments. I feel more strongly about the ideals of socialism than I ever did. Still, many thousands of old radicals, like myself, vote for the goddamn Democrats. And yet, as I look back on that decade, the 30s, it was for radicals the most exciting period in American history.